Welcome to the Ultimate Coach Podcast, Conversations from Being, inspired by the book, The Ultimate Coach, written by Amy Hardison and Alan Thompson. Join us each week with the intention of expanding your state of being, and your experience will be remarkable. Remember, this is a podcast about being. It is a podcast about you. To explore more deeply, visit theultimatecoachbook.com. Now, enjoy today's conversation from B. Welcome back. My name is Philip Bartu, and today I am joined by a fresh voice joining us from Colorado. We have Jeff Munn here today. Jeff, thank you for requesting to be a guest on uh, the podcast, and what a what a delight to be here with you today. Wow, thanks, Philip. I really um, I've been looking forward to this conversation because I've been, you know, following the group and thinking about reflecting on my own experience with Steve Hardison, which, uh, you know, it, it was one being with session in 2014, but it really started me down the path toward being a coach, which I've been a full-time coach since 2016. And I use it as a reminder for myself that this concept of being isn't about adding or affirming or positive thinking. It's about revealing what we already are. Such an important distinction you're pointing out there. Now, I know from getting to that place, tell me a little bit about how that journey was for you, which is really going from adding to revealing. Yeah. You, t- I'd, I'd love to hear, what was your experience there? What were some of the things that you could, looking back, you can see that you were, it was more aspirational and there was more adding and more work going on. And, and then what, what were the shifts that happened for you? Yeah. Well, first of all, I don't want to create the impression that somehow this is done or complete or finished. It It is a, an ongoing struggle for me. It's an ongoing, like this conversation itself is a reminder. Right. I mean, there's a, there's a, a lot of performance-based self-worth, let's put it that way, that goes back to my childhood, that goes back to how I got a sense of self-worth in the world. You know, my my dad was very different than me. He was like a an athlete and popular and all of these things. And I was not that kid. I was this, you know, fat, sweaty, stressed out kid who figured out he was good at school. Mm-hmm. I figured out I could get straight A's. I figured out that, you know, my teachers lit up when I raised my head, hand and said something smart, you know that I got rewards, you know, from my parents when I did well in school. And that continued all, I mean, I went, you know, I was number one in my high school class. I graduated from college with high honors. I went to a top law school. I was on the partner track at my law firm, like every step of the way. It was like, well, what's the performative thing that I can do to get the next reward? Mm Mm-hmm. And I would jump through that hoop. Yeah. And it took me a good 15 years of doing that, you know, if you count like high school through law school and my law firm, before I began to question, hey, wait a minute, is this actually, does this actually feel true to me? Is this actually making me happy? Is, is there some sense of purpose or meaning in, in any of this? And there, and the, I remember having this moment where I looked at the law firm partners, my my peers who were a few years ahead of me. That was the big reward. That was the next hoop to jump through. And I thought, are they happy? And most of them weren't. It was like, okay, I, I've got this wrong, but I didn't know what to replace it with. So I changed jobs and I got on a different track and 
it was better, but it wasn't great. And when I had my being with session, it was Steve Hardison in 2014. So this is like years later and, you know, a couple jobs later and he saw right through all that. Like he, he looked at me and he said, you're so damn polished and I don't care about any of that. I want to see the real you. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't even know who that was at that point. It was like, what do you mean? This is who I, I am. I, I am. My, I am. <laughs> I worked my hard to be this damn polished. <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it, and it, and it, took a while to just begin to let go of some of that yeah to reveal oh so these are some of the things about me that you might think are weird that i've been hiding from you like my my interest in spirituality and meditation that i kind of brought on as a coping mechanism for all the stress right like i mean i had i had all these interests i thought they were weird i hid them so i began to kind of reveal that a little bit when I when I started out as a coach, I mean, this is so, it's so messed up, but I, I instantly went back, you know, of course, forgot everything Steve had said to me, even though it comes back to me <laughs> every now and then. And of course, the, the you know, the book, even, even the book, I can read in two ways, depending on my mood or where I am that day, right? I can right. read it as... This is about revealing who you are and kind of your own authenticity and vulnerability and all. Or this is a construction project and you can you can add shiny new windows or, you know, uh, whatever, you know, whatever new facade you want yeah. and affir affirm your way to that. Yeah. It's either a construction or a deconstruction. Yeah. Yeah. And when and my experience of that is so different when I remind myself, oh no, this is just about letting out the real you. Uh, this, you know, this this kind of whatever it is that's looking through our eyes, Philip. And yeah, it's 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 refracted through our personality and our unique qualities, but it's also infinite and it's way more than enough. And it doesn't need anything in front of it. When I was uh, starting out as a coach, I I just got into this backwards way of thinking about things where it's like, well, who do I want to work with and how would I need to present myself so that they would hire me? Hmm. How can I fit into the mold that they yeah. want me to fit in? Yeah, and and, yeah. and so with that one reading of yeah. being, yeah, I could read it as sure. Well, how who do I need to be for them to hire me? Right? Yeah, of course. Who do I need to be to fit in that mold? Yeah, right. Yeah, right. That's it. Instead of who am I really, and then trust that the right clients will find me, and that's a totally different experience. You know what I'm hearing, and that is is a complete relaxation and letting go of the striving. I just yesterday I something I haven't done in so long. I I um I took three hours. I went by train for three hours to meet a friend for lunch I hadn't seen in twenty years. And in those that lunch turned out to be a four hour lunch. And what was remarkable was just how damn comfortable I was in my own skin. And there was no trying to impress. There was no trying to convince. There was just two human beings enjoying each other's company. And I couldn't believe we had lunch. It, we, we sat down at 12 and we left the table at four. Wow. And, you know, it's just, for me, what happened there was just such a um, reminder of the importance of authentic connection. And it was actually a business lunch, but 90% of that conversation was purely relationship. Yeah. And and I think what, why, when I come back to who do I need to be, it was just like, man, I just need to be a friend, just being relaxed and curious and 
it's like when you it's like when you hang out with friends there's no real there's no agenda the agenda is just enjoy each other's company right and what i'm hearing there is all yeah what if we could just just have more of that yeah what if that was always our agenda and that was it yeah, what if that the the agenda? You know, people people say the agenda is shot with no agenda, and yeah. that's cool too. But I I I also appreciate just um, the agenda of just enjoying each other's company. Yeah, I mean, I think that's so true. For whether you're talking about friends or romantic relationships or business relationships. It, it it can feel scary to show up unadorned, if you will. And whenever someone else has shown up that way with us, it's so powerful because that connection piece, I, I mean, to me, like, you know, you can talk about money or titles or starting a company or any of this stuff, but like when I feel most alive is when I feel connected authentically to another human being. Yeah, I'm just letting that not really sit with me because I'm I'm wondering, you know, I'm really wondering if in business there's a space for that. And I mean, what what what's occurring to me is there's so many times where we go in with an agenda and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's definitely task before relationship. Yeah. And and it's just the, having an agenda where it would be relationship first and then the task at hand somehow allows the connection, allows us to perform much more deeply in whatever we're up to and whatever we're creating because there's a level of listening and speaking that's happening. And that's, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, I mean, I'm just seeing this quite, I wouldn't say new, but fresh from, mm. from what you're sharing with me. I, I'm thinking of a, a couple of my clients where they're running businesses and that's that's what we're working on. And sometimes the place where they have the most difficulty is actually, so both of these clients are men and it's with their wives, you right. know, like how, how do you say what you want? How right. are you vulnerable? What did you do that felt vulnerable this week? And that, I mean, that, that crosses boundaries across your whole life you know just how am i how am i more real not only about my what i'm good at where i struggle what i want how am i clear and what opens up when i am yeah so one of the reasons we're here today is there's something I, that you picked up on this idea of toxic positivity can you share more about that? Yeah, I think for me that shows up when I'm trying to pretend things are going better than they actually are, or trying to pretend that I'm more confident than I actually am, or trying to, um, you know, it's that it's that first reading of who would I need to be, and uh, you know, how do I use my document to make myself better? You know? Yeah, yeah. So when it comes from a place of I'm not enough, right? It becomes a tool to become enough. Right. And then the question, who do I need to be, is additive and uh, just creates more ways to do work on yourself. Yeah. And and also, like, isn't that interesting, that question, who do you need to be? I've always struggled with that question. And I've always struggled with the word need. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Me and, too. And it's not that there's, you know, I recognize that different people resonate with, with, with different language. And and there was a time where I, I moved it to who do I get to be? 
And, uh-huh. and that even feels somehow that doesn't even resonate with me anymore. And so for me, actually what's coming up for me now is just who am I being? Really? Just who am I being? And and who do I, yeah, just who, rather than who do I want to be, just notice who am I being? Oh yeah, I'm I'm being fearful. Right. So if I let go of being fearful, then I'm coming back to nothing. And yeah. then I'm be and then from nothing I can be something. Well, and and what's coming up for me as you're saying that, Philip, is just to acknowledge in that moment the fearfulness or the neediness or whatever is, you know, whatever is happening for you, whatever is happening for me. The acknowledgement and the being of that allows it to shift and change and dissolve and turn into something mm. else. Because we're always, you know, being is not a constant state. We're in flux. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, that's just perfect because it brings the humanity to it. Yeah. Because if I'm, if I'm being fearful and I'm telling myself, well, who I need to be is confident and I'm trying to do confident on top of fearful, but I haven't really been with the being fearful. I've been avoiding being fearful, <laughs> covering up with something else. And then, of course, that's the, the whole self-forgiveness piece is um, a way to free yourself, liberate yourself. Yeah. And, and, I th- and I think what you're speaking to is, even before any of that, actually being with the being fearful piece part of you. Right. And allowing that to be okay. Yeah, not denying any of it. It's all it's all yeah. It's all you do. It's all whatever is showing up in any moment and our our humanity is this beautiful thing and we spend I spend a lot of time trying to ha- hide about half of me. You know, the fearful, insecure worried about my business, worried about whether I'm going to get this client, you know, all of that stuff instead of just saying, oh, yeah, there's that again. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. And there's always an in order to, right? Like yeah. the hiding comes from an in, in order to what? Mm-hmm. I know in my case, it's covering up an insecurity. Yeah. And then it just becomes inauthenticity. And I, well, what, I, what I was really good at was being very inauthentic about being inauthentic. Yeah. <laughs> and then I am being inauthentic. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's beautiful. And to see that, right? I mean, and I I do it too. It's just a, oh, there I go again. Well, not not just that, yeah. And then building some noble ideas. Mm-hmm. I'll, give you, I'll give you an example of the level of inauthenticity that I have experienced from so at the age of 27, I, it's always my dream to have a restaurant. And I opened a restaurant in Lisbon in Portugal. Mm-hmm. And at the time, there was a law that came out. And so you could choose if restaurants were smoking or non-smoking. Now, I was very proud to be one of the first non-smoking restaurants. And I made that choice. And that weekend, I was with my girlfriend and her father, who happened to be the main investor of our restaurant. And I was speaking to him. And in that conversation, I said to him, hey, you know, I was proudly proud to tell him we've we decided we're going to be a non-smoking restaurant. And he looked at me and he said, well, you're free to choose what you want to do. But I just want you to know that if you're going to have a non-smoking restaurant, then I'm never going to come and I'm not going to come with any of my friends. And quite mm. frankly, it's a pretty poor business decision. Opening a restaurant is already risky. Now, opening a non-smoking restaurant, it's just a risk I wouldn't do. But you're free to do what you want. Yeah. So so I went home that day. And, um, oh, and then he said something else. And he says, and on top of it all, that goes against my values. Uh-huh. And I was like, well, well, what do you mean? You're not, you're not even a smoker. And he says, no, I value inclusivity. And what you're doing is discriminatory. And I came home that day and somehow 
out of my fear to confront him, I bought into the idea of this story of inclusivity and I made that so noble. And I said, no, no, I, I want to be inclusive. And really, what I was afraid of was actually going against his recommendation. Yeah. And I was afraid of him, of, of not looking good in his eyes, but I was also afraid of him not coming with a lot of influential people that would be good for the business. And so I went against my own principles and values. I was out of alignment. And um, boy, did I suffer. I was breathing. I was breathing in smoke every night. My health took a hit. I, gosh, I lost myself. And this was a time where the restaurant was like super successful. You had a waiting list of people to come in that weekend, but the cost was like I sold my soul to the devil. Yeah. And it eventually led me to burning out because I didn't just do this with, I was just trying to please everyone. And I think, I think this comes back to, you know, looking back at this foundational question of being, I was so needy of being loved being loved by him, by others, of others, of other people's approval, the pressure that I had, that, that I was living in from, from all, from, from just this impossible task of, yeah, living up to other people's standards and ideals of right. what they think is right and wrong and being completely disconnected to my own truth and values. It's a it's a very similar journey with probably similar health implications to the one that I took as a as a lawyer and you know working incredibly long hours because you know I had been told and I had believed that I needed to do this thing to be successful and to feel successful and it was not true and it came at great personal cost to me including uh you know panic attacks and probably a decent amount of self medication yeah and that that it's what's resonating with me as you as you're saying that philip is what a what a radical act it is in our society to look inward for those things rather than outward yeah. Like we are, we are surrounded by messages of you need this thing. You need to be this way. You need to show totally. it in this way. You need to act this way. And then on the other side of that will be happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction, whatever. And I've never seen anyone achieve any level of satisfaction by pursuing external things. So what what was the shift for you when you really noticed that you're starting to look inwards? It wasn't a huge it was more of a gradual shift. I'm a very yeah. sl very slow learner. <laughs> I mean the first the first was like the oh the partners aren't happy, why do I want to be a partner? During the course of my corporate career. So I was in the corporate world from, you know, the the late 80s till 2017 when, or 2016 when I lost my was laid off from my last corporate job and and during that time it was this slow process of alignment this willingness to ask myself am I happy does this feel true to me and it wasn't just corporate stuff it was um you know I went through a uh, a divorce as well mm -hmm. and that was a huge yeah. learning of again you know selecting someone as yeah. a partner who on paper looked like exactly the right fit and in mm. actuality was not and and, and then and, having and, you to know, it, come it's... to terms to that with that and and, yeah. and and make the move to say okay i'm i know this is going to throw my life and and the mm -hmm. life lives yeah. of some others into upheaval, but yeah. this isn't right. Yeah. Oh, it takes otherworldly levels of courage to be in alignment 
it, it's such a courageous act. I think it's a word that isn't used enough when it comes to alignment. It's it's a courageous way of living. I mean, I like you, my first marriage, I remember three days before the wedding, Bing. my mother-in-law pulls me aside and she says, I need to say this because I'm not sleeping at night and I have a message for you and I don't think you can hear it, but that's okay. My job is to share it with you. And I knew that what she was about to say was really the truth. And I was so afraid of what was about to say. And she looked at me and she said, my daughter is not ready to get married. She is not ready for that level of commitment. And I just right. want you to know before you get into that. Wow. And that was, actually it was three weeks. It was three weeks before getting married. And I, you know, when you hear the truth in something, but you don't want to hear the truth. Oh, yeah. So for me, to be in alignment required such a level of courage to, to actually confront her, get clear on that. And the implications would be canceling the wedding three weeks before this is an international destination wedding. Uh huh. Which at the time just seemed like way too big of a deal. I would just like so it was it was a choice to ignore the wisdom. Mm -hmm. And you know how long my marriage lasted? Two and a I... half months. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. I was married for two and a half months. Because yeah. once I got married, and once I got over all that, it was then I didn't have to deal with disappointing all the people that had come and everything. So the kind of the whole Thanks. the whole wedding in a way was, um, I mean the whole thing was out of alignment and and I can look back and speak about it from here. But at the time when I was in that moment, there was there was very little awareness. To tell you the truth. You were probably terrified. You didn't. I mean, I I know so many times in my life where yeah. I, on some deeper level, I knew the truth, but I was I wouldn't let myself see it. So you know, I think when you say you're a slow learner, I think what what it is is it's to me. I I, I think I would describe it as it wasn't. I I was slow at really fully stepping into that level of courage to be in alignment yeah and disappointing that amount of people yeah i think for, i think for me at different at different stages of my life there was the first question was are you actually willing to look and then are you willing to see what you're looking at and then are you willing to act on it and and I, I feel like as I look back at, you know, if you if you want to assume for the sake of this conversation that there is this, whether you call it God or life with a capital L or intelligence or whatever acting through us and and presenting learning opportunities, I feel like life has been pretty masterful at giving me what I could handle in the moment in, in, in preparation for the next lesson, whatever, whatever that is. And in the cons, in the, if we take it back to being for a second, it's consistently been about dropping things. You can drop, oh, you don't need this either. You don't need this either. You can actually be this. And then what is revealed in that place is way bigger mm. than anything you could build on the sense of lack. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so, I mean, I love that story, Philip. I've got a, mine isn't two and a half months. My marriage was nine years, but it was, it took me a long time just to even recognize, oh, wait, I'm, I'm not happy. Yeah. It's, it takes a level of self-honesty Yeah, to say that, you know, the crazy thing is if you had asked me while I had my restaurant, 
I would have told you I'm happy. Yeah. But it, and, and my answer would have been like, yeah, business is good. I've got great friends and like, this is I have this great girlfriend and I'm living in this beautiful apartment. And I would give you a checklist of everything that I had achieved to be happy because my formula was once I have all this, then I'll be happy. And I had completed, it was a full formula. Yeah. And so in my, in a way, I was formularically, yeah, I was happy. And looking back, what I really was, was I was a very functional, depressed human being. Listen. I was functionally depressed, but I was unhappy without self-honesty of confronting my unhappiness. Right. And I was inauthentic. And I was, you looked at me and you thought, wow, this guy's like, he's got it all. And, and people were envious of me. Oh, I went through the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that resonates as true for me so much. And and as you were talking, Philip, what came up for me is this, um, I had unconsciously written a success handbook, a set of rules, you know, a, a bunch of boxes to tick off about, you know, education and job and partner and where I lived and all, you know, what kind of car I drove, all of these things. And, and I had them all, I mean, you, you know, to a degree, I mean, we don't, you know, those things are, you, you yeah, you, know, you can always trick yourself into thinking, well, if I just had this promotion or if I just had this, right? But I I had a lot of it. I think that there were plenty of people who outside looking in think thought I had it all. And to confront that I had written myself a bad set of rules and that they didn't work, I it took me a long time to be willing to go there. What are the set of rules that you've written for yourself now that you believe do work? Well, they are rules that I'm still getting. I, I get better and better at following them. Show up as authentically and as true, real as I can in the moment. As much as I can say what's on my mind and what's occurring for me. You know, I think there's one test that I have for myself is to, when I notice myself hesitating to say something, I I ask myself, am I hesitating to say this because, you know, I don't quite have the relationship with the other person or I'm afraid of hurting their feelings or I'm afraid of, you know, but is my concern about the other person? Or is it my concern about what the other person will think of me? And if it's about the latter, I try to just put it out there. Yeah. You don't stop yourself. I yeah. don't concern your, yeah, you're free to speak up and speak straight. Yeah. And that, that one's hard. Yeah. Depending on the context, depending on the yeah. topic. But that, I mean, I'll, I'll go back to a earlier part of our conversation where I, I really, where I am right now is I feel like what I most want in the world is to be true to myself, to to drop those facades, and through that willingness to feel authentic connection to a small number of other human beings who are willing to do the same in my life. From with coming from that intention. Yeah. And there's that part of yeah, letting letting go and, and rediscovering yourself. What is it that you're really excited to create from that place? Community. Say more about that. Yeah. I've noticed myself just being willing to reach out to more people and, and have that be the offer. Hey, I'm noticing this. How about you? 
hey, I'm noticing wanting to talk about this. How about you? Well, well you said you said community. Yeah. What kind of community? Is this something you're actively building or is this something you're still still? So I I have been doing some work with John Patrick Morgan and discovered in that process, I mean, I had uh I had built this one-on-one coaching practice and I have a small number of one-on-one clients that I've I, I feel like I'm able to really do deep work with over a period of time. You know, some of my clients, I mean, you know, we'll work together multiple years and we'll go and we'll go deep, but that's a small number of people. Through my work with JP, I began to get connected with other coaches who were in earlier stages of building their businesses. And I just really enjoyed being in conversation. And so I, uh, I just, this was just an experiment. And I know Philip, you, you and I didn't talk about this before the conversation, but you know, I had a, I just offered a zoom call of like coaches who were interested in talking and we did it like three weeks ago and the 10 people showed up and we just had a lovely, like, Hey, what's, what's up with you? What's going on for you? Where are you struggling? What feels true for you? What feels like it's difficult with this to the extent that I have an agenda it's in sharing my own experience that as I got more clear on who I was and just being that my business actually took off and You know, I think that's true for anyone building a business, including a coach. And that that idea that we have to, it's like, oh, but I'm not an experienced coach or, oh, I've never talked to such and such. You know, we'll get in our heads and we'll create all these stories. And then we, you know, I will mm-hmm. go into the, when when I'm in that place, I'll go into the story of like, well, who would I need to be to show up? And and I've done that and I've I've seen where it goes and I've felt the energy in myself of that. And I just... I just want to share it doesn't have to be that way. In the simplest form, it's also, oh, your being is is not stopped by the internal dialogue. Yeah. Trying to protect you, trying to tell you what you can or cannot do. And I think ultimately who you're being is a way of freeing yourself. So there's something much bigger running the show than your internal dialogue. Yeah. And when you think what our brains do to us when we're in fear... It's the opposite of what you need to do to create a business. You know, fear makes you want to stay small and safe and look like everybody else and not be different and fit in. And that doesn't do much. If you're trying to say, hey, here's how I can help you, I do it just like everyone else. (laughs) They're, you know... Yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so acknowledging the fear. And then there there's there's that kind of fear and then there's more the the could I really do this kind of excitement that can show up. It's like, wow. Maybe I am enough to try something like this. Wow. Um, and maybe it doesn't matter that I am enough or not. Right. I can throw maybe maybe I, I can, I can just, just throw that all out and just yeah. And just choose. Right. And just create and not be stopped by my internal dialogue. Yeah. And just put it out yeah. there and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, and not think of it as success or failure. It's just like data. Like, oh, yeah. That didn't that didn't work. I'll I'll try something else. Yeah. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for this refreshing, simple reminder to look within, to slow down, to enjoy, to create from a place of relaxation, authenticity, and service. That's really what yeah. I'm hearing in, in your message. And, uh, you know, this is su- su- such a great reminder for us to, to hear. I think you said two words that really 
hit me hard, Philip. Simple and and reminder. And and I have to constantly remind myself how simple this is. Mm. Yeah. And my, my brain will go off and create projects and plans and ways of offering myself or showing up in the world or, you know, kind of different different clothes to put on metaphorically and physically. Yeah. Well let's let's let this episode yeah. be a place to come to when we need when we need reminding, which we always do. And we often do. Not always, we often do. And so let this is a this episode is a place to come back to to remind ourselves when we lose course, when we're off course. Yeah, thank you, Philip. Thank you for um being such a good partner in this creation together. Yeah, well thanks. You know, we came in this conversation with an idea and just allowing it to unfold so beautifully. Yeah, thank you for playing. For people that want to know more about your community, your offerings, what you're up to, how can they what's the best way for them to get in touch with you? Yeah, probably the easiest way is to just send me an email at uh Jeff at jmun.com. I mean, I am on Facebook and involved in some of the groups. So for friends on Facebook, you can send me a message. I do a fair amount on LinkedIn. That's a good place to connect as well. But yeah, start with an email or a message. Let's uh, let's talk. I would I would love to hear from anyone who this resonated. Beautiful. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for your time today. And thank you to you, our listeners, who I also want to just celebrate that the podcast has just reached a top 5% of the podcasts in this world, whatever that means. It's thanks to your continued listening and support and special thank you as well to those that have written reviews it makes a difference and we really appreciate it and thank you for your contribution until next time thank you for listening if you know someone who would benefit from today's conversation please share this podcast with them also we invite you to visit the ultimatecoachbook.com so you can continue your personal exploration of being There you will find links to join our wonderful community, get your own copy of the Ultimate Coach book, and more. Simply go now to www.theultimatecoachbook.com. That's www.theultimatecoachbook.com. The link is also available in the show notes. We appreciate your support. Be blessed. Be you.